they're connected with some edges. And uh, so the overall idea here is uh, we have these networks everywhere. So it could be a, uh, a food web where you have predator prey networks. It could be a biological networks where you have these uh, proteins. And then you also have uh, these like citation networks where nodes are papers and edges are citations between nodes. You can have a power grid where it kind of represents the network of the electrical grid, or you can have a road network where you have roads and edges uh, and, 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 and nodes are kind of uh, junction points. Um, so for this specific community, of course, uh, you see a lot of uh, uh, these uh, networks on the web as well, the web itself. So this is the internet at the AS level. And uh, you also see lots of social networks. Uh, and then within social networks, sometimes you see graphs like group membership networks, where you have these bipartite like structures, uh, where users are parts of some uh, groups, and sometimes users are also connected. So it's not always completely bipartite. And sometimes you can create networks where they don't actually exist, but you can kind of uh, form some sort of network, let's say a knowledge graph, where you can use for like fact checking, or you can create some network among the words that you observe online. Um, so once you have these networks, then the question is, what can you do with them? And I guess um, there are lots of ML applications that take as input a network. So for example, there's a lot of supervised and semi-supervised node edge graph classification methods where the goal is to predict some sort of type for a node, for an edge or for a graph. And uh, sometimes there is some sort of supervised or unsupervised link prediction where the goal is to predict whether two nodes should be connected. So example would be uh, a friend recommendation on, on a social network. Uh, you can also compare two networks. So for example, measuring their similarity, see if they share some uh, common pattern. And uh, if you think about it in terms of an ML pipeline, then the usual first step is doing some sort of uh, traditional feature engineering. So the first step usually is to have some sort of suitable network representation that these methods can be applied to. And uh, if you look at traditional graph representations, well, we have these like, uh, node edge diagrams that kind of look like this, where you have nodes and edges connecting them. Uh, and, and sometimes to make this more computer friendly, I guess you have these like matrices, like the adjacency matrix where you can represent the graph. So node VI and VJ, when they're connected, you have an entry uh, one at, at I and J, and otherwise you'll get a zero, or you can represent them with uh, an adjacency list or you can represent them with some edge list. So all of these, they have some specific limitations, these representations. Uh, specifically, it's really hard to characterize and describe a graph when you have these representations. For example, it's really hard to say how many cycles the graph has, or if it has a lot of them, or, uh, or a lot of triangles. And it's, it's also really hard to compare two graphs. So for example, if I have these two graphs, they're actually the same graphs with different layouts. So V1 is at a different place in the first graph than the second graph. Uh, but it's really hard, especially when you have two large graphs to say, for example, if they're the same. And so this obviously is the problem of graph isomorphism. Uh, finally, it's really hard to visualize graphs. You get these like hairballs, where if you have a lot of nodes and edges, then you have a lot of edges crossing each other. And there's not a lot of insights you can get from such drawings. So, you know, as John Tukey said, you know, the greatest value of a picture is when it kind of forces you to see what you never expect to see, and you don't really get any sort of insight from this. There are, there are other difficulties with these representations. Uh, you know, they're not compact. So, you know, if you have a lot of nodes, then the adjacency matrix becomes really, really large. So we're trying to address some of these with interpretable network representations. And so it, it's, I guess, important to first define what's interpretability. So an interpretation is kind of a mapping of an abstract concept into a domain that humans can understand. And interpretability is the degree to which you can kind of understand the cause of a decision. And in terms of a network setting, basically this means either when you design the representation, you have some sort of clear meaning what it means. And, and so when people observe that representation, they have the understanding, or you have some sort of post hoc explanation. So once you have the representation, let's say you get it from some graph neural network, then you have some way to describe, okay, this number two here means this. 
Um, so for example, later on, Danai is gonna talk about graph summarization methods. And when she's talking about VOG, uh, we have, there are these uh, uh, subgraphs that can describe a graph. So, so there's some vocabulary that you can describe a graph. And this can be generalized to let's say temporal graphs where she talks about time crunch and later about uh, uh, basically streaming graphs where you have this persistent activity patterns. So you actually have no vocabulary. And Shengmen will talk about spectral moments where you can represent the graph with spectral moments. And in that case, you actually have a clear meaning of what the spectral moments means. And then later on, we will talk about how you can interpret the, the output of a graph neural network. Okay. So uh, just to get back to those questions, so why do you need a network representation? Well, you want to understand, describe, characterize a network. You want to see how the network looks like. You want to see what the properties of the network are. You want to understand the behavior of machine learning model. So why does the model arrive at a certain decision? So let's say you have this graph on the left and you have this graph on the right. You give both to a machine learning model and it gives you the same results in terms of performance. And the thing you want to know is, well, these two graphs are seemingly different. So why do I get the same result? And obviously, if you had a representation that would you know, spit out X for network one and X for network two, you would say, hey, they both match on this X. So maybe that's at least on the correlation level why I get the same result. Okay. So let's talk about some basic ways you can hardwire interpretability. Basically, you can uh, define a network using some representation and that representation itself provides some level of interpretability. So one easy way is to measure something about the network, and then that measure can be used to represent the network. Of course, this is lossy, but you can you know, compare, do they match on this measure? You can visualize the network, it's a one-dimensional point. And I guess the best candidate in this case would be graph invariance. So what's a graph invariant? Um, think of two graphs that are the same, in a sense that they are isomorphic. So they're just labeled differently and drawn diff differently but you have the same kind of connection. So there's some sort of permutation that maps graph one to graph two. And a graph invariant is kind of a function that takes these two graphs as input and the value of that function would be equal. So it's a function that's invariant under all isomorphisms. And there are different types of invariants. So there are node level invariants and graph level invariants. And we're gonna talk about some examples here. Of course, there's a lot more. And Sometimes invariants are binary, where you have connected graphs, you have bipartite graphs, you have Hamiltonian graphs, and basically you measure the graph and you output this binary value. Is it connected or not? And that could be your representation. Sometimes they're integer, so you measure, let's say, the number of nodes or edges, you measure the diameter, and sometimes it's a real number. So you kind of, uh, these are, you know, a graph can be represented as a square matrix, and in that square matrix, you can maybe, uh, measure some specific eigenvalue to, to, uh, to, to represent the graph. Uh, you can have a sequence, maybe the degree sequence or some probability mass function for that graph for some property. Or you can have a polynomial because you, know, you have these square matrices, so you have a characteristic polynomial to represent the matrix. Or you can use the Tuts polynomial, this beautiful representation of undirected graphs where you, know, you have this two variable function where it, it's based on the uh, connected components of subgraphs. And I think there's another variation where you use these W functions in terms of uh, edge deletions and contractions. Uh, there are other useful perspectives. You don't really have to use a, a, an invariant. Sometimes there are some other tools that provide some sort of interpretability by design, and you can use those to represent the graph. For example, you can use spectral properties uh, they, th this powerful set of tools that kind of describes the graph. You can use the relationship between a network and subgraphs, or you can use the global structure. Maybe there's some pattern that you see at the global level on a graph and you can represent the graph by saying that it has this pattern. Um, so these are some examples for the node level invariance. I'm gonna give some examples of graph level and um, some examples of the last category. So. When I want to represent any node in a graph, uh, for example, I can use any centrality measure because centrality measures usually have a meaning. There's a reason why people came up with that centrality measure. Of course, 
um, as a community, people usually do not believe that the, these are realistic models of networks, but here we don't really care about that. We care about something that describes the network in terms of some interpretation. So, for example, I can say a node is important because what that's what centrality uh, measures do uh, when it has more connections. So I can say the centrality for node VI is DI, it's degree. And in this case, I can say a node in the center is the most important node. It has degree eight. And I can do the same for, for other nodes. I can generalize this and say, well, not only you should have more connections, you should have connections to more important people. Think of a social network. And in this case, we'll get eigenvector centrality. I can, I can generalize that. The, the solution kind of boils down to getting the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the adjacency matrix. And that eigenvector essentially becomes your representation that has a meaning. Um, I can extend this. I can say, well, you, you depend, you, you should have more important friends, but you have some base case centrality importance. So that gives you cats. And you can say, well, your centrality gets divided among your neighbors. So that gives you page rank. And there are uh, lots of other centrality measures. Um, some non-centrality measures, for example, you can use local clustering coefficient. In this case, you can say, I'm gonna represent a node uh, using uh, some sort of measure that captures how well connected your neighbors are. So the example on the left, uh, we call the clustering coefficient is one because all three neighbors of node V1 are connected. And on the right, uh, clustering coefficient is zero because all the neighbors are disconnected. So dash lines means the connection is not there. So that's the node level. Graph level, you can do a lot of simple things again. You can measure the size of the graph, how many edges it has, the density, average degree, the length of the longest, shortest path, the diameter, the global clustering coefficient, number of triangles, or you can look at the degree distribution, essentially uh, how the degrees in the graph are distributed. And if you look at the x-axis here, x is the degree and y is the fraction of nodes having that degree. And sometimes that could be a good representation for a graph. It could be interpretable in a sense that, for example, on social networks, you see this kind of scale-free like behavior so of course this is debatable not people right now they don't consider this a general rule sometimes you know a, a, a different kind of distribution fits better but at least it can distinguish between a social network and a, let's say a road network where the distribution is more uh, like a uniform distribution as opposed to what we have here okay so you don't have to use invariants so all of these are invariants you could also again look at these different tools that are useful. For example, you can use tools from spectral graph theory, where spectral graph theory kind of connects the structure of a graph with the eigenvalues or eigenvectors of some associated matrix. It could be the adjacency matrix, which we talked about. It could be the Laplacian. It could be the normalized Laplacian, which has some nice properties. Basically, the eigenvalues are bounded. And uh, it could be the random walk transition matrix that describes a random walk on a graph. And once you have these eigenvalues, then you can do something with them to represent the graph. For example, you can use the extreme eigenvalues as Cheeger's inequality uh, discusses that. Or you can use the overall distribution of eigenvalues where you look at the spectral density. So this is what Shengmin will talk more later on. And, and you know, more examples will be uh, discu discussed in the representation section, of course. Uh, you can look at... The subgraphs, you don't have to use spectral graph theory. You can say, well, I have a graph, I get a subgraph, and maybe if I get enough subgraphs or important subgraphs, that can actually describe or represent my graph. So these special subgraphs could be network motifs or graphlets, it could be communities, it could be sampled subgraphs. And a network motif in this case is some small subgraph that is frequently observed in networks. So these could be uh, stars or triangles like the ones we have on the left. And they are usually more, they have a higher frequency than expected. So you have some sort of null model that tells you, hey, this is, you're observing this too much. And then you could have a graphlet where it's kind of a, like a connected non-isomorphic subgraph. So you have some sort of code word where you have this system and then you kind of look at it and say, hey, in my graph, I have a lot of G15s and G17s. And so if somebody sees the output in terms of like two G15s and one G17, they could just look at this code word, uh, code book, and they can kind of say, okay, that's that's what the graph is built from. Um, so you can kind of look at these network motifs and graphs as like look, capturing the local structures of the network. And you don't have to use these, you can also use communities. 
in a sense that uh, you can divide your graph into specific communities and you can describe a graph using those, or you can sample some subgraphs. The idea is a large graph can be represented using representative samples. So these could be graph sampling methods that they take lots of samples. So for example, random node, random edge, random walk based methods. And, and based on those, you can actually describe, describe your graph. Finally, you can use some sort of graph global structure to, to represent your graph. <clears throat> so for example, you can say, if your graph has this specific pattern, uh, for example, a core periphery structure, uh, which is shown on the right, where you have a graph which has a dense core and it has a sparse periphery, um, then, uh, then you know, I, I output this value as my representation, which is one or something. <clears throat> I can look at different patterns. It doesn't have to be these. These are just some examples. It could look at for a bow tie structure or some other thing. So this is a very old paper that discusses that on the web. And, and so all of these are kind of some hard ways to hardwire uh, interpretability into, into uh, your representation. Uh, but you don't have to do these. You can actually use some other methods that can help you achieve that. Uh, examples include graph summarization method where Denai is just going to cover. And then network embedding methods and network visualization methods, which Shengmin is going to cover. So with that, I'm going to, we're going to switch to Denai. And uh, I think she can take it from here. Then I. Thank you. Uh, can I share? If you stop sharing, you can try. All right. Uh, can you hear me fine? Yes. All right, perfect. Um, one second. All right, can you see the slides fine? Yes. All right, perfect. Great. Uh, so um, I'm Danai Kudra, I'm an associate professor at the University of Michigan, where I'm also an associate director for uh, the Michigan Institute for Data Science. And uh, I'm also an Amazon scholar and actually I'm spending uh, my sabbatical this year at Amazon. So I'll be covering, as I said, the graph summarization methods. Um, Again, a reminder, this is a very incomplete overview of related work um, in this space. And I'll be focusing mostly on interpretable representations. Uh, so the content that you'll see is partially based on a survey that um, I wrote a while back with uh, some of my students an ACM computing survey, as well as um, two tutorials. I've given um, one of them with collaborators, Yilis Rikin and Francesco Bonci. So let's start with what is um, graph summarization and I'll define it by what it does. Um, and um, what it does is it seeks to find a short representation of the input graph, uh, such that it reveals some patterns in the original data and potentially preserve some structural or other properties that um, Reza already mentioned. Um, what is being preserved really depends on the applications and in a little bit, I'll show you some applications. Now, the short representation can be in different forms. It can be in the form of an aggregated or sparsified graph or a set of structures and I'll revisit that um, in a little bit. Um, sorry, let me pause for a second. Um, I think it has timings on and it's progressing without me pressing. Uh, give me one second. Um, yeah. All right. Let's do this again. Right, and at the bottom of this slide, you can see um, a super graph, um, which consists of super nodes, that is collections of nodes in the original graph, uh, and super edges that connect those nodes. Now, in terms of properties that may be preserved, again, there's a lot of different possibities, a lot of properties that there is already mentioned, but here I'm giving you 
just a few examples, right? Some methods try to preserve the node degree distribution. Others try to preserve the community structure um, and they're more oriented towards community related applications. Um, others try to preserve the information propagation, right, influence over the network or diffusive properties, um, which essentially maps to preserving the first eigenvalue of the adjacency matrix in the summarized graph. Um, and other methods look at uh, preserving entities of interest or some type of similarity or utility of the graph in order to help with um, query answering. Um, again, it really depends on the application. So why do we care about graph summarization? The reason is that uh, by definition, it helps with reducing the data volume and the storage requirements, um, which means that now fewer input output operations that are needed. And in turn, this allows algorithms and queries that operate on the summary graph to be much faster than um, processing the whole um, large graph um, that uh, we start from in many applications. Um, another perk of graph summarization is that it can help with interactive analysis and visualization uh, for exactly the same reason, right? We reduce significantly the amount of data that we need to load and interact with in real time. Um, another uh, thing that I really like about graph summarization is that it helps eliminate the noise and by doing so, it also reveals patterns and anomalies in the data. Now I want to revisit the summary type that I briefly mentioned before. Uh, so I already talked about this super graph representation that you will see throughout um, the, this part of the talk. Um, and you can see one example at the bottom. So we start with this small uh, graph of five nodes, right? And then we group three nodes into one super node and the other two, four and five are grouped into a separate super node. And then we have an edge between them that it's called super edge and it maps to the number of edges between the constituent nodes of these super nodes. And again, this is a very common representation and I'll talk about different methods that can uh, result in this uh, network representation. Another representation is a sparsified graph. So some summarization methods will try to sample some nodes and potentially edges um, of the original network. Um, and others just return a set of uh, structures or influence propagations over the original graph. Uh, so it's not a single, a single summary graph that is connected, but potentially disconnected structures that are being identified. Another way to categorize the output of a summarization method is by whether it returns a flat um, representation or a hierarchical representation where you can zoom in in different levels of abstraction. So there's a lot of different ways in which we can um, categorize summarization methods. Here I'm showing you a taxonomy that we used in the ACM Computing Surveys article, uh, where we looked at different types of input networks, and then we categorized the methods based on the key methodology that they employed, the key uh, technique that they employed. Um, and key techniques include grouping or coarsening, um, compression, simplification or sparsification or sampling uh, of nodes and edges and influence analysis. Again, in this part of the tutorial, I'll give you examples um, uh, for graph summarization that focus on interpretable structures. So the most popular technique for uh, summarizing a network um, uh, is um, grouping based. Uh, it uses some type of grouping. So it aggregates nodes into super nodes and um, connects them with super edges. And there are two approaches to, to get to this. One is to leverage existing clustering methods, the simplest being what you see in this figure, where we can apply a clustering method and just represent each cluster with a super node or community with a super node and connect them with weighted edges. Or an alternative approach is to greedily aggregate nodes based on some optimization function, right? And I want to, again, give you an overview of how different methods may greedily group, uh, group nodes. So some methods uh, group nodes that exhibit some frequent pattern. Others um, want to group nodes such that the reconstruction error is minimized, right? The final, the summary graph approximates as much as possible the original one. 
um, or the group nodes that are structurally equivalent or maintain some diffusive properties, often the first eigenvalue of the adjacency matrix. Or if we're talking about heterogeneous graphs, um, we want the group nodes not only uh, that are structurally similar, but also uh, they, they are of the same type. Now, if we go also to graphs with attributes, more generally um, methods group nodes that are structurally similar and um, also share the same or very similar attributes. So I'll give you a few more concrete examples. And I'll start with a very simple approach, uh, which is uh, graph densification. Um, and this one aims to reduce redundancy around high degree nodes. Um, so the way that it does it is that it compresses neighborhoods by introducing uh, what is called a compressor node. So here in this picture, you can see some white low degree nodes being connected to red high degree nodes. And what this approach does is it tries to find these types of bipartite cores between the white and the red uh, set of nodes. And it replaces all these edges with one node, the compressor node. So all the low degree nodes now point to that. And that compressor node points in turn to the high degree node. So it significantly reduces the number of nodes. If we had n times m edges uh, originally, we have n plus m in this um, representation. So you can see that it significantly reduces the um, uh, storage requirements for the original graph. And this is used to answer exact um, queries for pattern matching queries. This is not a, a new um, idea. Uh, the, the implementation and the, the um, queries that they were looking at were quite new, um, but it had come up also much earlier um, for um, summarizing web graphs. Uh, and at the time it was called virtual node um, compress compression. Now, as I mentioned, another very popular approach for uh, summarizing graphs is to use compression. And um, usually what is used for compression is the minimum description length principle or MDL, uh, which is a formalization of Occam's razor principle that says that the simplest explanation is probably the best one. Um, so in this work by Navla Kaitel, they looked into um, two-part representation that consists of the super graph that I've already talked to you about, or the aggregated graph, and also this edge correction C, which says which edges are not correctly represented in the super graph with respect to the original network. Um, so in this formulation, they try to minimize the overall cost of describing the original graph with this aggregated graph and the corrections. Now, in terms of interpretability, what you can think of is that these super edges between super nodes correspond to basically bipartite cores. Um, right? the, we have all the connections between the constituent nodes of these two super nodes, while a self loop corresponds to a click. Uh, so these are um, structures that we know their graph theoretical properties, um, right? And we can understand what they map to. Um, more recently, with my students, we looked into graph summarization for um, graph neural networks. And the motivation here was that um, we wanted to handle noisy, small samples of high dimensional data and also support interpretability, right? So again, you can see here a super graph, um, which now is being learned within a node grouping layer. Now, the, the idea behind this was that some nodes and edges are expected to be more relevant to the predicted variable. In this case, imagine uh, performing graph classification. So we want to identify the nodes and edges that explain the graph classes that are being predicted. So the node grouping layer at the high level hides the non-indicative edges into super nodes. You see those here in gray and highlights the indicative edges that span across super nodes, uh, highlighted here in blue color. In a little bit more detail, essentially we're, we're learning a common membership matrix um, that 
basically describes the super graph, right? It says which nodes belong to which groups. And um, in here, it's not just a binary uh, membership matrix, but we have real valued importance scores, um, which uh, essentially compute how important each node is for the prediction task. Now, for interpretability, we can impose different constraints like non-negativity. We want the scores to be positive, right? To, so that they're meaningful. Um, we want orthogonality, so nodes belong to one uh, super node each. One difference from other grouping approaches that I mentioned before is that the nodes in these super nodes do not have to be very well connected, uh, which is usually the case when we greedily uh, group nodes um, uh, to optimize some function. Um, here, nodes, the, the, the grouping is learned such that it helps in the downstream task. And um, just to showcase how we can get interpretability with this uh, grouping layer, I want to share one application, which is uh, for fMRI-based brain graph classification. So we have subjects that undergo fMRI, we have their brain graphs, and we want to predict their cognitive ability. So now the question was, which regions in their brain, which map to nodes in a graph, uh, which regions in their brain um, are related to uh, cognitive ability or which things is the model using to predict cognitive ability. Um, you don't need to worry about all these acronyms. Basically, they correspond to different brain networks. Um, again, these you can think of as nodes in the brain graph. Uh, and you can see what grouping that uses this grouping layer and other uh, methods are uh, predicting. Um, but the point is that this grouping layer helps us identify the most task positive subnetworks, which are known to be active during cognitively demanding tasks, like uh, this task that I'm showing here, working memory, gambling, emotion, and social. Uh, while other methods identify regions of the brain that map to movement of the mouth and hand, which, it, which are things that subjects are doing during the task, but they are not really related to, the, to their cognitive ability. So now let's talk about new, uh, groups of nodes that correspond to easy um, to understand patterns. And I, I gave you already a, um, a glimpse into this. Um, all right, so I'll talk about pattern-based summarization, uh, which aims to summarize an input network via important structural patterns, as uh, Reza also pointed out earlier. Uh, these uh, techniques, as you'll see, often combine grouping techniques and compression. So the first example that I want to show you um, summarizes the graph with um, frequent or rare path-based patterns in k-neighborhood graph. So it looks into each k-neighborhood um, of a node. Uh, it extracts paths and counts the frequency of the different paths. Um, and then depending on what representation they want to obtain, uh, whether it will be frequent or rare, they keep only the most frequent patterns or paths or the least frequent paths. Um, and they end up with this egocentric abstracted graph. And going beyond paths, Dune and Schneiderman um, focused on three key motifs, um, which they call fans or stars, Right? We have um, the central node and spokes, connector nodes, uh, which look a lot like the densification work that I showed you before, or the vir virtual node compressor, compressor, and then clicks as well. And uh, the goal of this work was to essentially unclutter the original graph by uh, replacing these graph structures with these icons that you see on the right, the size of which correspond to uh, the number of nodes that, or uh, yeah, the number of nodes and edges that um, they're presenting. Um, as you might have guessed, this is used for visualization, right? Indeed, it can help with um, taking up less screen space. It is much easier to um, use some layout uh, to uh, place the, the graph nicely on the screen, and it can aid with understanding. And you can see here original graphs. Um, that are being visualized and what they look like in the simplified version um, where they have identified those patterns. And relatedly with collaborators in mind, we looked into uh, vocabulary-based summarization, which aims to uh, construct a succinct summary of important graph structures. Um, 
And to make this problem tractable, um, we considered specific structures. Uh, this is called the, the vocabulary, right? So we have stars, chains, um, clicks, and bipartite cores. Uh, and we consider not only these, but also deviation, deviations from these, since real worlds don't have perfect structures. Um, and uh, again, so that you have an idea of what these could map to, um, they, they could map to um, some interesting underlying phenomena like popularity, right, for stars or chains often capture some influence propagation or rumor propagation. Um, so, um, as I mentioned before, MDL or minimum description length is often used. So this is what we used here. We want to find the summary, the summaries of this nice form, right? That has the the click stars chains and so on, and also salt and pepper noise. Anything that the model does not capture, and we need to perfectly describe or reconstruct the original graph. Now. This, this approach uh, has several steps like subgraph extraction, characterizing the subgraphs in terms of their shape, right? So we know what they look like um, and we do that with MDL. And then by using MDL globally, we can find the final summary, uh, the, the structures that uh, are more important for summarizing the graph. Um, and we don't only have a bag of structures, but we can rank them on importance based on how much they help us compress the original graph. So that can be used for attention routing. Again, to give you an idea of what these could map in application, we looked into summarizing a Wikipedia co-editor graph. Um, and what we found is among the most important structures were stars that corresponded to admins, bots, heavy users, as well as bipartite cores. Uh, that were edit wars between vandals and admins, for instance, um, and a lot of other edit wars as well. So, so far I've talked about some simple structural patterns like paths, stars, and clicks, right, that we've seen in different works. Now I want to go beyond those and talk about rules which combine structure with rich uh, semantic information. Um, so the formulation should be familiar by now. Again, we want to find the concise summary, in this case of a knowledge graph, which I'll define in a bit, consisting of uh, what we call um, rules, inductive soft rules. And again, we want to minimize the description length of the model. The model here you can see it has rules and also uh, the bits to describe deviations from that model. Um, this work we applied to knowledge graphs, uh, which uh, store general information about the world and the, and the structure of a graph. And um, from a graph theoretic perspective, you can think that a knowledge graph is represented by an adjacency tensor that has the connections between nodes and the relations that connect those nodes, as well as a node label matrix. Um, over here, just to give you an example, a knowledge graph has information like, uh, you know, Leo Tolstoy uh, has written War and Peace, right? So that is a triple, an edge um, in the knowledge graph. What do rules do? Well, they assert things about nodes with um, the root label. So for instance, here I'm showing you one rule uh, that applies to books. It says that books um, have uh, fictional family characters, and they're written by authors born in countries, right? So it's not just a structure, but it has a very con um, concrete meaning. Um, and rules are formulated recursively in this work as rooted, directed, and labeled graphs. Uh, so you can see here the recursion where we have the root label and children rules that are being defined. So using a formulation like what I showed you before, um, we can get the model, a set of rules, but that describe what is normal in the graph, but also we can find what is abnormal, any exceptions to the rule or unexplained parts that can be used for identifying different types of errors in a unified way, like entity confusion, missing links, incorrect facts, and also identify where information is missing in a knowledge graph. Now, in the last um, bit of this uh, part of the tutorial, I'll go from static patterns to temporal patterns, right? If you think about it, a lot of graphs evolve over time. Um, so uh, we may want to uh, summarize time evolving graphs as well. Uh, and one approach to do so is to uh, summarize frequent graph patterns. And indeed, is, there's a very rich literature on this. 
on temporal motif mining, frequent subgraph mining, um, or well, we can use graphlets and so on to summarize a graph. Um, however, these uh, methods typically focus on frequency, right? And they ignore how the patterns evolve over time, right? Some patterns may be um, bursty and they may appear a lot of times in a short amount of uh, time, while others may continually and regularly appear, but they may have a smaller frequency like computer network attacks that are stealthy or commute routes. Um, so another approach for summarizing graphs is to use uh, time crunch. This is an extension of uh, Vogue, uh, the vocabulary-based approach that I mentioned before, to temporal graphs. So this approach does not only identify these patterns, uh, but it also characterizes how often those appear. For instance, here you can see in a phone call network, um, it spots a one-shot nearby apartheid core um, between uh, 792 callers on December 31st. Right, This maps to uh, probably um, handshake calls between well-wishers. Um, right? But you can also find um, other patterns that appear in a, um, uh, in a specific time range or uh, patterns that appear periodically. Another approach would be to summarize a grass stream with what we call persistent activity snippets. Um, and this does not require predefining the vocabulary as in the previous work. Um, and activity snippets are sequences of edge updates that reoccur among specific nodes, um, which um, you could see here in the animation. There are different ways we can measure persistence. One simple way is to capture uh, the, the width of the interval in which the snippets appear, uh, the, their frequency, uh, but also how they're spread out, um, right, how uniformly those uh, occurrences are spread out, which we can capture with entropy. Um, and uh, in this work led by my student, Caleb Belt, we also uh, proposed PenMiner, which has offline and streaming variants for identifying persistent patterns in graphs. Um, again, I want to show you one example where um, that, that shows what can be done with persistence in addition to frequency. Um, so what we look into is this PVF plot, persistence versus frequency. Um, that allows us to identify a lot of different types of patterns, like persistent activity, subtly persistent, or bursty activity. Um, this is applied to Stack Overflow, uh, so it identifies engaged discussions as well as regular interactions between users. Now, to, to summarize this part before I hand off to Shengmen, um, we um, looked at a very short overview of works on mining and learning interpretable summarized network representations in different graphs, static, dynamic, knowledge graphs, streams. Um, and as I said, the most common technique involves some type of grouping uh, to identify communities or easy to understand structures or um, maybe a learned grouping um, that helps explain some outcome um, in a machine learning model or graph-based rules um, and so on. Now, in terms of the focus in the literature, um, most of the work um, focuses on an attributed undirected graph, which is a simple case, but it imposes a lot of challenges. And there's less work on attributed, directed, signed, time-evolving streaming networks, or even uh, summarizing multiple networks at once. And there are also a lot of opportunities to look into the power of summarization and coarsening uh, within a representation learning. And with that, I'll let um, Shengmen uh, take over. Okay. Thank you, Danai. Um, okay, let me share my slides. Okay, can you see my uh, screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Shenming Jing from Syracuse University. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about interpretable network embedding methods and the network visualization. Then I will uh, show a short demo. And finally, I will have a discussion on the explainability in graph neural, neural networks. Okay. Uh, so firstly, let's look at uh, interpretable network embedding methods. Uh, 
given a graph, the idea of network embedding is basically to map each node in a graph to a vector in a low dimensional space, which is called the node level embedding. Or you can map the whole graph to a vector in a low dimensional space, which is the graph level embedding. In our definition, we consider uh, for a network, network embedding to be inter interpretable if, if each dimension of this vector is interpretable or understandable to human being. In other words, each dimension should have specific meanings to people, such as like the uh, density of the network, like degree distribution or subgraph information. Uh, okay, so for interpretable node level embeddings, here we conclude three types. Uh, firstly, graphlets or network motif based embedding. Uh, graphlets or network motifs are basically small subgraphs which often repeat a lot in networks such as triangles, squares, or lines. As you will see, people use information of these small subgraphs to represent a node. The second type is the random walk based embedding, which embeds a node based on the random walks starting from this node. Finally, a uh, spectral embedding, which use the eigenvalues or eigenvectors of the associated matrices. Uh, so for graphlet, uh, graphlet based embedding, the general idea is to use those small subgraphs or patterns to represent a node. One example is called a uh, graph, deg graphlet degree vector. Uh, the main idea is to count the number of graphlets a node touches. For example, uh, how many triangles or squares a node is in. In this way, we can capture the local structure of a node and its neighborhood. Mm, now let's see how it works. Before going to the details, we first introduce the concept of uh, automorphism orbit. Uh, basically, the position of a node in a graphlet, considering the symmetries. Here's an example. Uh, we have three graphlets, which are an edge, a triangle, and a wedge, which is a line graph of three nodes. Mm, when we consider the node position for the edge, the position of two nodes are equivalent. It also happens to the three positions in a triangle, which are also equivalent. Mm, however, for the, for the wedge, uh, there are two types of position, uh, the, the centering node and the side node. Therefore, here we have three graphlets but we have four orbits, A, B, C, and D. Mm, if given a graph G to get the graphlet degree vector of node V, uh, we basically count how many times uh, node V show up in each, each positions. And then we get a vector of the frequency. This, is, this vector is the graphlet degree vector for node V. Okay, uh, next type is random walk based embedding. The main idea is to observe the random walk starting from a certain node. One example is using the return probability features uh, proposed by the paper Red GK. It makes use of the K step return probabilities of random walks on the graph G. Basically, you start from a certain node and you take a random walk you check the probability of getting back to the starting node after k steps. Then you vary this k from one to s. You can get a vector of length s, where each dimension is the return probability of a random walk of a certain step size. Here is a toy example. Uh, in graph G, we look at three nodes, C1, C2, and C3. Uh, these three nodes have the same node degree, but if we plot their return probability features with step size from one to 200, uh, as you can see, the curve of C1 and the C2 are very close. But for C3, which is the yellow curve here, the return probability deviates in early steps. Next one is the spectral embedding. Uh, the classic example of using the uh, the classic example is using the first k eigenvectors uh, of of Laplacian or normalized Laplacian of a graph to embed each node. This embedding has been used for spectral clustering on graphs. Uh, 
the main idea is that uh, if we have a vector x of uh, length n, which assign a real number to each node, then this x transpose L x uh, uh, can be written as a quadratic form. And the quadratic form can be viewed as uh, the penalty on difference uh, between connected nodes in terms of x. Therefore, we want to minimize this quadratic form to uh, smooth the function x over edges. It turns out that when x is the first few non-trivial eigenvectors, uh, the, the quadratic form is minimized. This can, another way to interpret this spectral embedding is from a Felix view. If you think a graph as a spring network, basically each edge is a spring connecting nodes. Then you pick a face, you fix uh, the, these nodes, like as the uh, nails in this figure, then you let the rest of the nodes settle. Mm, uh, so let's say xi and uh, xj are the locations of node i and node j. Then in physics, we know that for the spring ij, uh, the force on the spring is basically the length of the spring, which is xi minus xj. And the potential and energy on the spring is half of the square of the, uh, the length. Mm, so uh, the contract. So the quadratic form is actually exactly the uh, total, total potential energy of the system. And the physics tells that the system will stabilize, these nodes will stabilize uh, uh, until the total energy is minimized. Therefore, the spectral embedding actually provides uh, the coordinates, uh, the coordinates of the nodes where they settle in the embedding space. Another example of spectral embedding is based on spectral graph wavelets. Um, the concept of spectral graph wavelets uh, uh, was proposed in the field of graph signal processing. Uh, the idea is that we first do the eigen de decomposition on the Laplacian of the graph, then we define a heat kernel, and by applying the heat kernel on the eigenvalues, we can get the spectral graph wavelet psi, uh, psi A, uh, it basically describes the dis uh, diffusion of the uh, spectral wavelet, uh, spectral wavelet uh, centered at node A. Specifically, uh, the, the m's value of psi A represents the amount of energy that uh, an, uh, node A has received from node M. Uh, so the diffusion pattern at a, a node can be used to capture the local network structure. As in the figure, Node A and the node B are located uh, in different parts of the graph, but if you uh, but they have similar local structures. Uh, so if you look into their uh, diffusion patterns, psi A and psi B, uh, you, you will find that like uh, they, they are also very similar. The method graph wave proposed by uh, Claire Donat and her uh, her, her collaborators, it learns the node embedding from, this, uh, from the diffusion patterns by treating the diffusion pattern as pro uh, probability distributions and the sampling from its empirical characteristic function. Uh, recently, Jing Zhu and uh, his colleagues proposed a general framework which extends graph wave by considering both network structures and the locations of these nodes in the graph. Uh, next, we look at the, the interpretable graph level embeddings. We also conclude them as a graph, graphlet based embeddings and spectral embeddings and embedding with network models. Um, okay, so for graphlet based embedding, one way to define a graph embedding based on its, is based on its distribution of graphlets. Let's say we select a set of n graphlets. We define a vector, and the ice, ice, ice value of this vector is the frequency of occurrence of graph letter i. Then this vector can be used as a representation for the network. So now the question becomes how to select how to select the representative graphlets. As the number of graphlets increase quickly, quickly with the increase of number of nodes. Uh, 
Shemesh's and his colleagues uh, choose to sample graphlets. The hope is that if a sufficient number of random samples are drawn, then the, uh, the empirical distribution is close to the actual distribution of graphlets in the network. And they provide a theoretical bound on, the, on this deviation. Then at KDD 2019, Yoshida and his colleagues formulated it as a convex optimization problem. They defined the distance between two graphs by using the weighted squared distance of their graphlet embeddings. Then they, they optimized these weights uh, based on the labels of uh, a graph, graph, uh, graph classification data set. Okay, next let's look at the uh, graph level spectral embedding. Here we introduced the embedding methods based on the spectral density. The main idea of this method is uh, to use the whole eigenvalue distribution of the associated matrix to represent a network. Spectral density is basically the probability density, probability density function of the eigenvalue distribution. It can be defined as the average of direct delta function at eigenvalues. Here's an example of the uh, histogram of spectral density of the random walk transition matrix for Facebook Eagle networks. However, uh, for large graphs, it is difficult to compute the whole spectral density as the eigen decomposition is high cost. Therefore, uh, in reality, uh, the estimation for the estimation for the spectral density is needed. Uh, people use different methods to do the, the estimation. Uh, Kohai Steiner and his collaborators have the estimation by using MCMC, and uh, Quan Dong and his colleagues use the kernel polynomial method for the estimation. These works have been published in KDD 2018 and, uh, KD, uh, and 2019. Here are the plots for the spectral density for different networks in Dong's work. For example, as we can see, uh, Facebook, Facebook and Twitter, these are social networks. Uh, their spectral density have the similar patterns, but the patterns are quite different from uh, those of the road networks, such as Minnesota or California road networks. So basically, the spectral density of different networks illustrate different patterns. However, it's not easy to compare to spectral density directly because the number of eigenvalues is equal to the graph size. So we need, to we need a measurement or statistics on the spectral density. Therefore, uh, in our work published in KDD 2020, we propose representing networks with spectral moments. The idea is to use the moments to capture the shape of a spectral density. The spectral moments of a random walk transition matrix has the following properties. Firstly, they have a very clear meaning. Uh, basically, the else moment is equal to the expected return probability of random walk of length L starting from a random node. Secondly, by definition, um, all the moments are between zero and one. Thirdly, there is a relationship between the eigenvalues of random walk transition matrix and the, the normalized Laplacian. As the eigenvalue of P is equal to one minus uh, the corresponding eigenvalue of L. Uh, in other words, by using the, the spectral moments of random walk transition matrix, uh, we are all actually looking into the spectral moments of the normalized Laplacian. Finally, uh, it is easy to easy and fast to compute by using MCMC. Uh, moreover, we find that these spectral moments are closely related to the network structures. For instance, we prove that uh, the second spectral moment M2 is equal to the product of the average degree and uh, the expected reciprocal of DIDJ for an edge connecting node I and node J. And the third spectral moment equals to twice of the product of the, the expected number of triangles and node is in, and uh, the expected one over DHDIDJ, where nodes HIJ form a triangle. 
Similarly, we find that M4 is related to the number of squares and the average degree. We also find that uh, spectral moments provide uh, various bounds on network properties, such as degree distribution, uh, global clustering coefficient. Basically, a large M3 uh, a large M3 provides a greater lower bound on clustering coefficient. And the network connectivity, smaller, basically smaller spectral moments, the more well connected the graph is. And the, the relationship between the network and its connected components. Also, you can use truncated spectral moments to represent a graph. For example, using the second, uh, a third, and a fourth spectral moments, M2, M3, and M4, uh, three values, it can provide a 3D embedding space, which can be visualized. Here I'm showing the embeddings of various types of graphs, including complete graphs, cycles, complete bipartite graphs, and the wheels of different sizes. I'm also showing real world networks from uh, three different categories, uh, social networks, for example, YouTube is shown here, and collaboration networks and the road networks. Uh, we call the whole embedding space the spectral zoo of networks because, as I will show, uh, uh, basically you, you can easily get information of a graph based on the location in this zoo, similar to like how animals are grouped and located in different regions of a zoo. Uh, the other type of graph level embedding is based on network models. Uh, network models are used to generate graphs to simulate real world networks. Uh, the most famous network model is Erdos Rain model. It is also known as the random graph GMP. It assumes that the, the, edge, uh, the edges uh, between nodes are formed randomly with uh, equal probability P. Another example is small world model. It tries to simulate this uh, six degree six degree of separation pattern, which indicates a short average path length between nodes. Uh, there are different versions of small world models. A well-known model is called the ward strogate model. It starts with a regular lattice and then rewiring the, the edges with probability beta. Uh, the, pr the parameter beta basically controls the randomness in this graph. As we can see, uh, these network models are based on certain assumptions, and they have some parameters to control the level or degree of these assumptions. Therefore, uh, these parameters are usually interpretable or understandable to people. So the idea of embedding with network models is that given a real world network, uh, we use a network model to fit the real world network. Then we learn the parameter of the network models, which can capture the property of the real world, real world networks. So here is an example of such a network embedding methods. Mm, it is based on the stochastic chronicle graph model. The SKG model is to model large, uh, large scale networks based on the stochastic chronicle product of matrices. Basically, it can learn a K by, K by K matrix from a network. For example, you can uh, set, set K equal, equals to two to get a two by two matrix. Especially when the network is undirected, the matrix is also symmetric, which means V equals to C. So the matrix gives three different values, A, B, and D. And if you extract this A, B, D values, then you can get a 3D uh, chronic embedding. And it is also called a chronic point. There are two basic properties about the chronic point. Uh, firstly, values A, B, and D are between zero and one. So any graph can be embedded to a 3D point in a one by one by one cube. And secondly, without losing generality, we can assume that A is greater or equal than D. So now let's look at the interpretability of chronic points. Uh, the chronic point is closely related to the global structure. For any chronic point, it will be in one of these three regions. 
when A is greater than V greater than Z, the graph shows a core periphery structure. Looks like this. Uh, you have uh, one group of nodes well connected and the others are periphery. When A is greater than Z greater than V, the graph shows a dual core structure. You have two dense groups, but few connections between two groups. When B is greater than A greater than Z, there basically there is no core in this network and it's called the no core region. Uh, people have studied the chronic points of different real world networks. It turns out that social networks and uh, biological networks, they are all located in the core periphery region, which follows previous studies on social networks and the biological networks. For rodent networks, they are in the dual core. So think about a rodent network. Uh, the connection between like states mostly relies on highways or truck, or truck roads, which is sparse. But the connection within the state are much denser. Mm. So uh, collaboration networks are mostly core periphery or dual core. We, we think this can be related to the, exist, the existence of community in academia. Finally, only uh, some small uh, random networks are in the no core region. Uh, next, uh, we want to talk about network visualization. Uh, network visualization is an intuitive way to present the network data in 2D or 3D space for people to see. And therefore, network visualization uh, techniques often provide nice figures for the network data. Here, more than these nice figures, uh, we, we want the network visualization can provide a better understanding of the network. So here I will introduce those network visualizations with interpretability. Uh, we consider network visualizations by using graph summarization, node level embeddings, and the graph level embeddings. Uh, for using graph summarization, I believe you have seen uh, some examples in Dr. Kutra's talk. Uh, the, output, the output of graph summarization is usually a supergraph or a specified graph. So we can visualize the supergraph or, uh, or, or, a specific, or a specified graph, which is much cleaner than the original network. Uh, and the such supergraph often carries the information of patterns or community information in the original net network. Next, we are going to talk about network visualization with node level embeddings. The idea is that um, by uh, uh, the idea is that by getting a 2D or 3D embedding of each node, you have the, the coordinate of each node in the space. Then you can locate each node with the coordinate. Mm. So one of the famous examples is the spectral graph drawing. Basically, you embed each node with first uh, with the first two non-trivial non eigenvectors of Laplace. In this way, you can draw a graph with a speckle embedding, which makes the which makes those be uh, better connected and those clustering together. And it also, as I have mentioned, it also minimizes the uh, total potential energy of the system. Uh, later. Uh, researchers try to enhance the spectral graph drawing by uh, adding higher order information. For example, uh, Huda Nasser and uh, her colleagues build a higher order Laplacian with clicks. Uh, and in this way, the visualization will capture more higher order connections between nodes, between nodes such as like uh, triangles or clicks. Uh, now we are going to look at the network visualization based on graph level embeddings. Uh, previously, we have seen uh, this example by using truncated spectral moments. We can represent a network uh, as a 3D point in this spectral zoo. Next, uh, we will, next, we will introduce a different method, which will represent a network with a shape in the 3D space. So the method here is called the network shapes proposed by our work at ICDM 2018. Uh, the method, uh, the idea to build a network shape is quite straightforward. Uh, there are three steps. First, we sample many sub, uh, representative subgraphs from the network. Uh, 
it can be uh, any graph sampling method. Then we find a network embedding method to map these samples or and the original network to a bunch of 3D vectors, which can be seen as points in the 3D space. Basically, we need to find a three-dimensional and incompatible embedding space for all these subgraphs. The last step is to fit a shape to these points. Uh, you can use any shape. You can use any shape you want, but in general, we want the shape can uh, cover all these points, and the shape should ac uh, accurately capture the distribution of these points. In this way, this 3D shape can be used to capture the distribution of the embeddings of the network and its subgraphs. So with this framework, you can propose your own network shape algorithm. OK, now think about it. Uh, each network is represented as a shape in the 3D space because the, because the embedding space is, is incompatible. Each dimension has specific meanings. So the location of the shape can tell the properties of the network. And the volume of this shape indicates the variance of the subgraphs in a network. Also, to compare two graphs, you, you can compare their shapes. Like the two shapes can be far away from each other, or they can be close to each other, or they can have overlap. And then the overlap will reflect the substructures these two networks share. Here we give uh, some examples like uh, in the figure. The figures uh, illustrate the network shapes of YouTube, uh, MySpace, and Awkward. Uh, we have like a few observations, like different uh, network shapes have different volume size. So uh, the, uh, the MySpace is greater, larger and Awkward is smaller. And the different network shapes are located a different way. And some of them have overlap, like uh, YouTube and MySpace, but others don't. Next, uh, we are going to show a demo. Uh, basically, we build a, we build a, we develop a web portal for users to draw a network shape. So when you go go to this website on the home page, you will see the. Uh, introduction of the method and the web portal, and uh, how to use like how to use the web portal. So basically, uh, it's quite straightforward. Basically, you click the draw a network shape. You you select your parameters and you click visualize. And then uh, basically, for some points after after like several seconds, you will see the uh, drawing here, and uh, you can select your own. Uh, you can select the sampling uh, method you want, like the random node random edge, and you can select the number of samples of a certain size, like uh, one to 20, and you can select like a sampling step. So for example, if you select like 10%, then the, the graph, uh, the, the, if you select like 10%, then the graph size will be, become from 10% to 10%, 20% to 90%. And then you can select the uh, embedding type of the of the uh, of the embedding method, and you can also uh, select your fitting type. Mm. Uh, and uh, you, you can also like upload a file like the for different uh, the, the the data you want. And after the visualization, here you can cl uh, download the, the click the download the file, and you will see the. Uh, Files like including like the uh, boundary points, the, the the points of the uh, uh, the points of the subgraphs, and also you will get the figures. And so after that, um, let's see. Okay, up to now we have introduced uh, several interpretable network representations which means these representations themselves carry specific meanings understandable to people. As we know, uh, recently, a lot of work has been done on the deep models on graphs, which is known as new, uh, graph neural networks. Uh, although most deep models are developed without interpretability, uh, 
uh, researchers still want to somehow explain the behavior of the graph neural network models. That's how the studies on explainability in uh, GNN comes up. And so firstly, let's have a quick comparison of explainability and interpretability. So a model is interpretable if the model itself can provide understandable uh, interpretations. While for an explainable model, the model itself is still a black box. Uh, but its predictions or behaviors might be understood by some post hoc explanation techniques. So for the, uh, for the explainability in GNN, let's say given a graph, we use GNN model to embed each node in the graph. Then these embeddings can be used for different applications, such as node classification, link prediction, or some, some, some other applications. To explain GNN, we aim to answer the questions like uh, which nodes or edges are relevant to the predictions. For example, the blue nodes here. And how relevant are they? And then how do we get the predictions? So in the study of GNN explainability, um, some of these techniques have been widely used in the uh, image and the text tasks. Majorly, there are two categories of methods. The first category is instance level methods, which is to identify important input features for prediction. It includes like gradient-based methods, perturbation-based methods, and uh, surrogate methods. The other category is model level methods, which is to study, imp uh, study input graph patterns and their relationship to the uh, GN behavior. So such methods will provide a more general and high level insights of the model. So we first look at the instance level methods. The first type is gradient uh, or feature-based methods. The main idea of the method is to use gradients as the approximation of input importance. And usually larger gradients means uh, higher importance. The example of such methods include like uh, sensitivity analysis. Uh, you, uh, it, used, it used the squared values of gradients as the importance of features directly. And uh, these gradients can be computed by backpropagation. And the guided BP, which is similar to SA, but only propagates positive gradients as negative gradients are difficult to explain. The second type of instance level methods are perturbation-based methods. The main idea is to study, study output variation with respect to the different input uh, perturbations. So basically given a graph, um, the model should stick with the current prediction. But if we remove some elements of the graph, let's say two nodes, and the prediction might change and then we get to know like the impact, the impact of these two nodes. So this can be done, but uh, so, so uh, now, 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 now the question becomes like, how do we perturb a graph? So uh, a, 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 a popular way is to mask elements out. Here is the general idea. So given an input graph with adjacency A, adjacency matrix A and the feature matrix X. So we used uh, an algorithm to generate a mask. Uh, and this mask will indicate the in, uh, important, importance of nodes, edges, or features. Then the generated, uh, generated mask are combined with the input graph and uh, to get a new graph. And the new graph is fed to this trained GNN and then use the prediction and objective function to value the, uh, this mask and the uh, mask uh, algorithms, generation algorithms. So the examples includes like a GN explainer, uh, which, you, which learns soft masks by maximizing the neutral information between predictions uh, of the original graph and the pred predictions of the new graph. The other type of uh, instance level methods is surrogate methods. Uh, the main idea is to 
use an interpretable surrogate, uh, surrogate model to approximate the prediction of the of complex models. So given an input graph and its prediction, so we first sample a local data set to represent the relationships around the target data. Then uh, different surrogate, surrogate methods are applied to, uh, to fit the local data set. Note that uh, these surrogate models are generally simple and interpretable machine learning models. So finally, the, the explanation from the surrogate model uh, will, will be regarded as the explanations for the original prediction. So one example is graph line, which use NHOP, uh, NHOP neighboring nodes and uh, their prediction as its local data set and uh, use Hilbert uh, Schmidt independent uh, criterion, Lasso, as the surrogate model. Next, we are going to talk about a model level methods, which is to explain the whole, uh, which is to explain the whole model. The example is XGNN, uh, which utilize graph generation. The idea is like this. Let's say uh, here is a set of graphs with the same labels. So by human observation, we find that uh, they, are, they share the same label because they share us uh, uh, the same small pattern. So what XGNN wants to do is to identify such patterns by graph generation. Uh, in XGNN, the graph generation is formulated as a reinforcement learning problem. So for each step, uh, the generate predicts how to add an edge to the current graph. Then the generated graph is fed into the trained GNN uh, to obtain the feedback to train the generate. In the end, it learns a generate so uh, graph generate so that the generated graphs can maximize the uh, target graph prediction. So uh, in this tutorial, we introduced the concept of interpretability in the uh, network settings. We start from the network properties or graph variance, invariance, including node level properties such as node centrality and the local clustering coefficients. And also graph level properties like degree distribution and uh, uh, we also discussed the uh, basic of spectrographs and we discussed the relationship between our network and uh, its subgraphs from small subgraphs like graphlets, uh, network, or mot network motifs, uh, to larger subgraphs such as communities or sample subgraphs. Then we introduced the, the existing network re representations such uh, which has the interpretability themselves. We talk about graph summarizations, including graph uh, grouping-based methods and the pattern-based methods. We introduce the network embedding methods, which embeds a node or a graph to a low-dimensional space. And uh, these methods basically use the subgraph information, such as graphlets, the spectral information of uh, a graph, or learning from the parameter of a mo network model. Then we introduce some examples of network visualization, which you utilize the graph summarization and the network embedding methods. Especially, uh, especially we introduce a method of representing a network with 3D shapes, which capture the distrib uh, distribution of the embeddings of a network and its subgraphs. Uh, we also provide a, dem a demonstration for the portal web portal. And finally, we have a discussion on the, uh, the explainability in graph neural, neural, neural networks. So uh, we, include the, we include the instance level me uh, models, which basically identify important input features pr for prediction, and the model level methods, which study what, what kind of input graph patterns lead to a certain gene behavior. So that's it. Thank you for being here. We would like we would like to uh, take any question, or if the time limits, uh, you can feel free to email us. Thank you. Thank you, Shengman.
So I think we have two minutes mm -hmm. left. <laughs> if there are any questions from the audience, happy to take them. Yes. Um, I'm reposting also the slides in case anyone uh, joined late and couldn't see, couldn't find the slides. Uh, one second. Let me check the other platform and see if there are any questions. All right. I think everybody is very happy with our presentation <laughs> and they really loved it. <laughs> yeah, let's interpret it that way. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all for attending. Uh, thanks, Abhisek, for, or, for setting up us uh, and making us co-hosts and everything. Um, so if you had any other questions, feel free to reach out. You have our emails. If not, it's on the slides. And you have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.